God is infinite love and infinite justice. He cares about us more than we care about us. So whatever happens in eternity, it's going to be just and it's going to be loving. But God can't force people to love Him because love must be freely given. So if people don't want Him now, they're not going to want Him in eternity. They can change their minds. I changed my mind. I mean, I always believed in God, but I didn't know who Jesus was until I looked at the evidence and realized who He was. There's a lot of people that were atheists or non-believers who have become Christians. So yes, people can't change their minds. That's why we're here. <laughs> so people can see some evidence and change their minds. But the point here is, is that God is ultimately loving and just, and nobody in the afterlife is going to say, this is unfair. It's impossible. He's, 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 the, he's the standard of justice and love. And he wants, it says, God wants none to perish. The only reason people perish is they don't want him. God chose the people he would save before he created the world. Now that's just another way of expressing what Paul says, that God chose us in Him, meaning in Christ. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Now we would make the case that that's part of the Reformed faith. This is a way of expressing God's sovereignty and that salvation is an act of God's election. And we can't peer into the divine mind and figure out why God chose some or chose not. What we're told in Scripture is that this is according to God's good pleasure, that it is according to His will, and that it is for His glory. And that's what Scripture teaches. But when we put that statement to evangelicals, we found that 44% disagree with that statement. Now, that may surprise you, or it might not surprise you. We've all bumped into those who are self-professing evangelical Christians who love the Bible, and they stumble, they truly stumble over this doctrine of God's sovereignty. The question comes up a lot, um, if God is a, a God of love and mercy and compassion, and He knows people are going to go to hell, why does He continue to create them, right? That is what's called the, basically that's the ultimate problem that's the ultimate agnostic atheist problem. We say God is all-powerful and all-loving. If He's all-powerful, why doesn't He save everybody? And if He's all-loving, why would He send anyone to hell? The answer to that is simply this, God is who He is. And you can't invent Him, and you can't change Him, and you can't alter Him. You can either believe in Him or not believe in Him. You can't accommodate Him to your own thinking. And that means if you don't understand His perfect righteousness and perfect holiness, the problem's with you and not Him. I don't expect to fully understand God because I have a jaded viewpoint because of my own fallenness and my own sinfulness. You know, I was reading the other day in Jonathan Edwards' uh, personal account or his personal narrative, which is the account of his conversion. And he talks about from the time he was a child that he had difficulty with the doctrine of God's sovereignty. And at one point he says, it even appears to me, or it appeared to me rather, a horrible doctrine. That's what Edwards said about his pre-conversion state. But post-conversion, he actually uses his newfound affection for that doctrine to express his conversion. He was taught by God the sweetness of that doctrine of God's sovereignty. And for those of us who embrace in all of its fullness the doctrine of God's sovereignty, we have learned that we simply cannot live and we cannot live the Christian life without it. But sadly, there are many who do read their Bibles and they attend evangelical churches and they call themselves an evangelical who stumble over this doctrine and outright find it offensive. They, they cannot envision a God who would violate their free will, and they cannot attribute to God this doctrine, which, which we would say is a, is a biblical teaching of divine election. Well, here's what this means. What this means is we've got our work cut out for us, don't we? We need to teach this doctrine of election. We need to put in front of people the biblical vision of who God is. I don't expect to have a full comprehension of an absolutely holy being. God doesn't ask me to be able to reason everything about Him in my pygmy mind, but God does ask me to believe in Him. 
And when he says he is holy and when he says he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, that that is a true expression of God. I don't know how that works together with his sovereign purpose and his sovereign ends. That's, that is the ultimate question. But as I always say when we have a Q&A, in every major doctrine comes from God and touches us, there's going to be an apparent paradox. For example, if I say, um, who wrote Romans? You're going to say Paul wrote Romans, or somebody might say, well, actually, it was the Holy Spirit. Was it all Paul? Yes. Was it all the Holy Spirit? Yes. Was it 100% Paul? Yes. Was it 100% the Holy Spirit? Yes. That's impossible. It can't be 200% of something. If I ask you who lives your Christian life, if you say, I do, you're taking too much credit. If you say, God does, you're not taking enough responsibility. I wouldn't blame it on God, and I wouldn't take credit for it. You have the same dilemma in everything. If you ask, is Jesus God or is he man? The answer is yes, fully God, fully man. Or truly God, truly man. You have that apparent paradox because you have the infinite God and his infinite perfections coming down to such a small, small mind. You know, we could all read into the Bible what we'd want to see there. Uh, we can all impose upon God what we want to see there. But we can't do that. that. That's not a luxury for us. That is not an option for us. We must come to the God who presents himself. We must come to God as he is, as he has revealed himself, and as he has taught us who he is. And then it's our obligation to teach that to others. We love this doctrine of the sovereignty of God. We know how important the doctrine of election is, how biblical it is, but we've got our work to do. And it's incumbent upon us to teach this doctrine and to proclaim this doctrine because it's biblical. And because without it, we're not being faithful to the biblical text. So as you think about this, and as you think about the people you meet to who stumble over this or who have difficulty with the doctrine of sovereignty, well, just lovingly, kindly, but firmly, poke and prod, and just put in front of them the biblical teaching, because it's very crucial and it's important that we do that. God finds no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God weeps through the eyes of Jeremiah over the death of the wicked. God's heart is broken. Jesus stood over the city of Jerusalem and wept. The prophets say, why will you die? Why will you die? Jesus says the same thing. Why will you not believe in me? Why do you reject me? So you don't want to turn God into some imaginary fatalistic being. You want to take the full revelation of his nature from the word of God. He is the God revealed in scripture.